start the new year, let's just get the hardest thing out of the way first, and we'll get to the easy stuff all the rest of the year. How about that? But today is a text to which there's a lot of confusion over. And I read probably this week as many commentaries as I've ever read to um, any sermon that I've ever preached. And to be honest, by the time I was finished reading all the commentaries, I, I think I was more confused than I was when I started because they contradicted themselves so many times. But I did gain some good things, and today I want to do my best with this text, and uh, I want to give you uh, what I believe is the proper biblical interpretation of it. And commenting on our passage today, uh, respected theologian D.A. Carson states, Matthew chapter 5, 17 to 20, are among the most difficult verses in all of the Bible. And I titled this sermon, Are We Living in Sin, or Did Heaven and Earth Pass Away? And some of you are reading that, and you're saying, well, that doesn't make any sense to me yet. Well, it, it will by the time we're through today. And I want to do my best to give you my thoughts on it. So let's get right into it today. Stand with me, if you will, for the public reading of God's Word. And we'll read Matthew five seventeen to 20. Hear now the word of the only living and the only true God. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You may be seated and let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this text. Lord, may I bring clarity to the text and not confusion. May you speak to us today, God. Lord, you've spoken in your word. May we hear it. God, may we understand it and may we apply it to our lives. Lord, that this year may be the greatest spiritual year that we've ever seen. Lord, maybe there's someone in the room today that doesn't know you. God, they're about to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of why Christ came. I pray today would be the day of salvation for that individual. Lord, I pray that those who are here this morning and they've been coming to church for a while, God, I pray today would be the day they could look back and say, and that was really the day I got serious about studying God's Word. I got serious about walking with God. I got serious again. Maybe I've, I've been a little stale in my Christian life for a couple of years, but Lord, it's time. I pray today is that day. In your name, amen. So the first question that we need to answer, and when I come to the text and when you read the text, we need to ask a lot of questions. And the first question that we need to answer about Matthew 5, 17 is, what does he mean by law and prophets? What are the law and the prophets? And my answer to this would be, the law and the prophets are the Old Testament. And the word that's translated testament can also be translated covenant. So when we read the Old Testament, we're, we're reading about the Old Covenant. We get to the New Testament, we're reading about uh, what we know as the New Covenant. And I want to give you some scripture verses where the Jewish writers of the Bible used the phrase law and prophets to reference the Old Testament. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 14, the Apostle Paul said this, I confess this to thee, that according to the way they call a sect, so serve I, the God of the fathers, believing all things that in the law and the prophets have been written. Essentially what Paul's saying is, listen, I believe and I teach everything that's in the Old Testament. In John chapter 1, verse 45, we read something very similar. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the man about whom Moses, in the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, wrote, Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. So law and prophets is just a Jewish phrase to refer to the Old Testament. And we need to understand that because this is what Jesus is predicting will pass away. And, and really, not just for this text, but when you read the Bible, you need to think Hebraically. We need to have a Jewish mind. This is written largely by Jewish writers to largely Jewish audiences. Now, there are Gentiles in the, in the New Testament that the letters such as Paul's are written to, and Luke's gospel th was written to Theopolis, to a Gentile. But if we as Gentiles in the 21st century in America are going to understand the Bible, we need to understand some of the Jewish mind and the Jewish thought. So this word, testament, can be translated covenant, and the law and the prophets refer to that old covenant. And when we read 
the Old Testament. And I said this in Sunday school earlier. You know what I think sometimes about the Old Testament? I think it's hard. I do. I think sometimes it's hard. And I hear people say, well, the Old Testament, you know, it isn't that hard. And I'm like, man, it's hard for me because I'm not in that culture. I'm not in that environment. But here's, if I can help you this morning, what the Old Testament was. The Old Testament was a dress rehearsal. Um, when we do plays and things, we'll have a couple of nights where we'll have a dress rehearsal, and then we'll have the real night. The real thing will come. The Old Testament was a dress rehearsal for Israel year after year after year. They could see the story of redemption played out for them. And the real thing happened whenever Jesus Christ came in the New Testament and brought in the New Covenant. So if you ask me, if you said, Pastor, when I'm reading through the Bible, should I read the Old Testament? And my answer to that would be, absolutely, you better be reading the Old Testament because the better you understand the Old Testament, the better you're going to understand what Christ has done for you in the New Testament. Andy Stanley, I don't know if you know him, he's Charles Stanley's son. The apple fell a long way from the tree. Andy Stanley says, we might as well just unhitch the Old Testament. We don't need it. I think that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. You can't properly understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. But what Jesus was saying was, was that the covenant they were under was going to pass away. Under the old covenant, Israel had some feast days. Here, there were seven of them. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles. And if you've been around this church for a while, you've seen those several times by now. And if you want to understand the Bible, you need to know those and become very familiar with them because they're everywhere in the New Testament. They don't always get mentioned, but they're alluded to and brought up because Jesus fulfills those in the New Testament. Christ had to fulfill them in order for the old covenant to pass away. So according to verse 17, Jesus did not come to set aside or to destroy the law. He wasn't just going to get rid of everything in their childhood. He was going to fulfill and accomplish it. Now, God gave the law to Israel to show the righteous requirements for men to come back into the presence of God. But there was a problem with the law. You know what the problem was? Who could keep the law? Nobody could keep the law. No, it, these are the requirements that are, need to be met in order for me to be right with God, but nobody can keep them? What are we going to do? And, and that's a dilemma for me and you as well. See, the Jews knew that they couldn't keep it. They were lawbreakers in need of a law keeper. And finally, Jesus says, I'm going to fulfill or keep the law. Can you imagine if you're a Jew? Nobody's ever kept the law. What are you talking about you're going to keep it? Nobody can keep all those commandments and live to this standard. Who's, who can fulfill everything that the prophets predicted? You're saying, Jesus, that you can do that? This is a major statement that Jesus makes, but it was the plan all along of the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Covenant pointed to Jesus. You say, preacher, how do you know that? Jesus said it himself. Look with me what happened on the road to Emmaus on the screen. Luke 24, verse 27. We read this. Jesus says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Well, what's that mean? The Old Testament. He started in Genesis, and he worked all the way through to Malachi. If there's one sermon I wish I could have heard, you know what sermon it would have been? That one. I want to hear Jesus teach everything in the Old Testament and how it pointed to him. That's marvelous. Jesus said, Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them, the disciples on the road with him, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He was always going to fulfill it. And that's a major part of Matthew's purpose in writing the book of Matthew. Let's look so far at what Matthew has presented that Jesus fulfilled. Matthew 1, 22 and 23, we read, So all this was done, the virgin birth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Why did he write that? Why did he do it? So that it would be fulfilled. Matthew chapter 2, verse 5 says, So they said to him, In Bethlehem, Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Jesus fulfilled Micah 5, 2. He was to be born in Bethlehem. Matthew 2, 14 and 15. When he arose, Joseph took the young child Jesus and his mother Mary by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod. Why? That it might be what? Fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Hosea, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. How about a couple more? Matthew 2, 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken 
by Jeremiah the prophet. Matthew 4. Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled. What's the purpose of Matthew presenting this gospel? What's he showing us that Jesus would do? He would fulfill. He's the great fulfiller. I hear people say he's the great I am. and all this. He's the great fulfiller too. That's not proper English, but he's the great fulfiller. And it's a good thing he was. Jesus is saying, and he's speaking to Jews here in the Sermon on the Mount. And he, he's saying, everything you grew up learning about, it was about me. I'm the fulfillment of it. And that's a big deal for Matthew. Jesus said, I'm not destroying it. I'm bringing it to pass. So that's verse 17 in a nutshell. And Christianity is in agreement on that part. Christ is the one who fulfills the law. And to that, we all say, amen. But church, can I ask a question this morning? And this is the question that needs to be answered. Why did Christ have to fulfill the law? And the answer is that no man could live up to the demands of the law. Do you get that? That's the core of the gospel right there. Christ has to do something for me that I could not do for myself. That's why we preach a gospel not of works. We preach a gospel of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. God has to do something for a man that he couldn't do for himself. I hear people say, well, I'm a pretty good old boy. I don't care how good a boy you think you are. You ain't good enough to go back into the presence of God. You ain't good enough to get yourself to heaven. And you ain't good enough to save yourself. If you were good enough, then God wasted his time when Christmas happened and God became a man and he murdered his son. He didn't waste his time. You need Christ Jesus. That's your only hope in life and death. The law was given to show that we're insufficient and weak. Look at Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Read, look at what it says. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh, Jew or Gentile, will be justified in his sight. Your legal standing is not going to be based upon you keeping the requirements of God. The Jews couldn't keep it. The Gentiles weren't under the law. Do you think, think about how far away the Gentiles were from God than the Jews. The Jews had it and couldn't keep it. The Gentiles were sure enough distance. No flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. When we read the righteous requirements of God, you and I know that we're sinners. It lets us see that we need Christ Jesus. And that's a problem. Because in order for you to be made right with God, you must keep the law. So you say, well, if I can't keep it, and i got to keep it, then I'm in trouble. Well, not necessarily. There's good news in the rest of this. Look at verse 21. If you can read that, you got good eyes. But now, this is good. This is the best thing I'm going to read today. If you don't get anything, get this. But now, the righteousness of God, how? Apart from the law, not on you keeping it, is revealed, being witnessed or testified of by the law and the prophets. The Old Testament predicted that one day somebody would come and you would be declared righteous by something other than the law. The righteousness of God, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, how? Through what? Faith. How are you and I declared righteous? We look to the one who was perfect, to the one who kept the law, and we believe on Jesus Christ. And our legal standing is no longer guilty, but justified and saved. Is that not good news? That's the gospel. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. To all, that's a Jew and Gentile reference, and on all who believe. For there is no difference, Jew and Gentile reference, for all Jew and Gentile have sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. Well, what's the glory of God? Perfection. Does anybody really want to stand up today and say, well, I'm perfect? Because the only person that can say I don't need Jesus is the one that can stand up and say I'm perfect. Friends, God says you're guilty. First John says if you say that you don't sin, then you're a liar. And the truth's not in you. We are in sin. We need a law keeper. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why it's such good news. God came to do something for us we couldn't do. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Being justified by payment, by what you do, by how good you are, right? No. Being justified freely, freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as the payment, the propitiation. How? By His blood. Through faith, not works. To demonstrate His righteousness 
Because in his forbearance, God passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now, do you remember the first Passover back in Exodus? Remember when Moses was in Exodus? The death plague comes through, the tenth plague. It's going to kill all the firstborn sons, except for those who did what? Had the blood over the doorposts. You know what the death angel did? Passed by all of those because of the death of the firstborn. Friends, it took the death of God's firstborn son in order for blood payment to be applied to your account. He would die so that you go free. That's the good news of the gospel. Doesn't get any better than that. When I say that Jesus is God's firstborn son, I don't mean Jesus came into existence in Bethlehem. I mean that he's the firstborn from the dead. Friends, so that you too, though we be dead in sin, can be made alive and live with Christ Jesus. That's the gospel. Then it says, in verse 26, watch this part. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Friends, you think about the justice of God. You're a sinner before Christ. You stand guilty in order for God to be just. You know what he has to do? Punish us. He has to send us to hell. We have to have payment for our sin. But friends, hear me out today. If you're saved in here and you're in Christ Jesus, God would be unjust to send you to hell. You know why? Because your sin has already been applied to Christ Jesus on the tree. That's the gospel. Not by works, but by faith are we declared righteous. Have you ever read anything more beautiful in your life than that? Just go home tomorrow and read Romans 3 and 4. Just read it and cry. That's what I did three nights ago. Just read it and cry. That's all you can do. Because God loved us. Verse 17 is not the problem. Verse 17 is not why this text is so hard. Verse 18 is. And it's a hard verse. So let me give you my best. Let's read verse 18 again. Uh, what verse 18 is saying in Matthew chapter uh, 5 is that once Christ fulfills all of the law, then the old covenant fully, the system, will pass away. And I want to be honest with you. The next 20 minutes or so are going to be difficult. But I firmly believe if you'll follow me and lock in, then you'll understand the Bible better than when you walked in here this morning. So Matthew 5, 18 says, For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now, if I asked you, church, are we under the old covenant today? What would you say? Don't answer yet. Let's look at a few things that are in the old covenant, and then you can tell me. Um, let's look at Exodus 23. It'll be on the screen. It says this. Three times a year you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you. The time appointed of the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me. Uh, and the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field. And the feast of ingathering at the end of the year. When you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field, three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God. I want to ask you, how many of you men have ever kept these? Have you kept these feasts at all? Yes or no? No, you haven't. All right. What about shrimp? How many of y'all like shrimp and lobster? I like shrimp and lobster. I eat a lot of shrimp and lobster. Let's look at it. Leviticus 11, 9 to 12. These you may eat that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or the rivers, that you may eat. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. You shall be an abomination to you. Uh, you shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Whatever, the Lord, uh, whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that should be an abomination to you. Uh-oh, we're over two, people. Let's keep going. What about tattoos? I know several of y'all in this church have tattoos. Let's see what the Old Testament said about tattoos. Leviticus 19, 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you, for I am the Lord. So what would your answer be? Are we under the Old Covenant still? Yes or no? No, and praise God. No. We're not under the Old Covenant anymore. We're under the New Covenant. I agree. But before Christ, when a Gentile would come, when a Gentile said, I want to worship Yahweh, the true God, what a Gentile would have to do was essentially become a Jew. He'd have to be circumcised. He'd have to start keeping this law. 
that's how he would identify himself as someone who now identifies as a worshiper of Yahweh instead of false pagan gods. And they would come to worship to Jerusalem, but the Gentiles had to worship in the outer court. See, the Gentiles couldn't get as close to the Holy of Holies as the Jews could. There was a dividing wall that was up in the temple. And history says that on that dividing wall, there was a sign for the Gentiles that said, you can't come any farther than this. Well, if you've read Ephesians, and I think it's in chapter 2, Christ broke down the dividing wall so that Jew and Gentile are all one in the new covenant in Christ Jesus. We have every privilege that anybody else has. But if you remember in the New Testament, it was a big deal that the Gentiles were no longer coming under the law. And the Apostle Paul, he was taking heat from everybody. They were saying, well, Paul's telling the Gentiles they don't have to observe the law anymore. What are we going to do about it? It was a big deal. Friends, that's an important issue for you and me because we need to know. If we're going to properly worship God, do we need to be keeping everything that we just read? Or is that done away with? Well, turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 15. I want you to read this with me and see it for yourself. Acts chapter 15. What happened was the, the church had to, to establish this. Are the Gentiles now going to have to keep the law or what, what's going to happen? So they called a business meeting. But the difference in what the Apostle Paul's business meetings and mine or your business meetings is people still got mad, but they discussed theological things and not what color the carpet was going to be. Okay, we don't get, I've been here two and a half years. There's not been a bad business meeting. Nothing like that. I'm just, that's just a joke because that's the running deal. So the church calls a big meeting. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Here's what we read. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you're circumcised, According to the custom of Moses, you can't be what? Oh, uh, that's kind of a big deal for me and you. Uh, because if that's true today, then how many of us in the room are saved? None of us. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So they call this the Jerusalem Council. Look down at verse 23. I want you to see what this council concluded. Acts 15, 23 says this. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such command, it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas, different Judas, the other one's dead by now, and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality, if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Essentially, what that means is, you cats ain't got to keep the old covenant law anymore, okay? Out of respect for some of your Jewish brothers, can you chill out on some of these things at the end? But it's not mandatory for you to do that. Okay, so clearly, that's settled for us. Me and you aren't under the law. You're good. You're not going to hell if you have a tattoo. You're not going to hell if you go to Red Lobster. You're okay. Go, whatever, that's fine. Dude, that's good. But let me ask another question, because this is important. Is the old covenant still around for anyone today? If a Jew today is a Christian, should they still be observing those things? What would your answer be to that? The answer's got to be no, because there's not a temple standing in Jerusalem. There's not a priesthood. There's not a sacrificial system. They don't have any of that. And by the way, they can never have any of that again, because in order to have a priesthood, you have to know who the Levites are. Well, does any Jew know what tribe they're in today? No, absolutely not. You can never have the Old Covenant ever again. But if that's true, then according to verse 18, two things must have been true. Let's read verse 18 again. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Point number one. If the Old Covenant is not on the scene today, that means all of the law has been fulfilled. Everything in the Old Testament has been fulfilled. That has to be true for me to you today. Number two, 
the old covenant would be on the scene until heaven and earth passed, what? Away. And I think number two is the exact spot where everybody gets confused. Um, because everyone looks around and says, well, the old covenant's gone. That's not here anymore. But heaven and earth, the ground, this, uh, that's all still here. So are we in sin or has heaven and earth passed away? Hence the title of my sermon. What do we do with it? Because that verse is teaching that the law, the old covenant law, would be around until heaven and earth passed away. Now, you're going to learn today about what I believe about this. Because I don't think that's a contradictory statement. This says, as long as heaven and earth are in play, then the old covenant law should be in play. Friends, I believe with all of my heart, and I believe that the Bible clearly teaches, heaven and earth have passed away. Now, when I say that, I know where your mind goes. You say, preacher, I saw the sun this morning. It's shining through there. The ground's beneath our feet. The heaven and earth are clearly still here. How can you say that the heavens and the earth have passed away? away and really to be honest church the fact that our mind goes there and that we ask that question it really is an indictment on us about how well we know the bible especially the old testament it's a failure on our part to not know the scriptures when you and i read matthew 5 18 as 21st century americans we think we're ready for bible graduation day when really we need to go back to kindergarten and learn the elementary principles of the bible when peter and john heard Jesus talk about the passing of heaven and earth, they didn't think about it like me and you did. They would have had a completely different view because they knew the Old Testament. And we need to think like them. Jesus is speaking to first century Jews, not 21st century Americans. If I asked you right now, every one of you would say, that Old Covenant's gone. Friends, if we say that, that means that whatever Jesus is referencing to heaven and earth has to have passed away. And let me ask a question. When you watch a movie... And y'all probably watched some movies over the break. Do you fast forward to the last 25 minutes of the movie and start there? Or do you start the movie at the very beginning and watch the whole thing all the way through? Well, we watch the whole thing all the way through. In order to understand the end of it, we need to know the beginning. So here's my major premise, and I want to spend a few moments here um, explaining to you why I think heaven and earth refers to Old Covenant Israel and the nation state. Not Israel now, but back then. Here's the premise. Heaven and earth have passed away. But heaven and earth is a reference to the old covenant surrounding the nation Israel, not the material physical creation. And half the people in the room knew exactly what I was fixing to say about that. Half of you are saying, I've never heard anybody say that. Well, when you hear somebody say that, the next thing out of your mouth needs to be, prove it. And I'm going to try to prove it to you right now as to why I can make that statement. Heaven and earth have passed away. But heaven and earth is a reference to the old covenant surrounding the nation Israel, not the material creation. Let's start back in Genesis. There are plenty of times when the Bible refers to the physical creation as the heavens and the earth. But there's numerous times when the Bible calls heaven and earth Israel and God's uh, covenant people. Genesis 15:5, we read this. Then God brought Abraham outside and said, Look now toward heaven. Count the stars, if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Genesis 13, 6. God said to Abraham, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be numbered. So Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars of heaven and the dust of the earth. From Abraham comes the nation Israel, this heaven and earth, God's covenant people that he would make. Moses called Israel. When he addressed them, he called Israel the heavens and the earth. He said, Deuteronomy 32, 1, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Now let me ask a question. Does the ground or the sky, do they have ears that can, be, that can hear? Like, no, he's talking to the covenant people, to Israel. He says, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. The prophet Isaiah does the exact same thing. Let me give you some more examples. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we read this. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Watch this part. Hear what? O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. And then he continues in on it. See, the writers of the Bible called Old Covenant Israel the heavens and the earth. 
they were God's creation in that sense. Isaiah 51, this will be the last one I'll give you, but note it with me again, please. Isaiah 51, 15 and 16, we read this. But I am the Lord your God, who divided the sea, whose waves roared. Now, can you think of a famous time in Israel's history when God divided the sea? Well, that's the Red Sea experience. We get that. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hands, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say to Israel, to Zion, you are my people. Let me say that a different way. When God brought Israel through the Red Sea, when he brought them to Mount Sinai and gave them the law, he essentially is saying, I made the heavens and the earth. I formed my covenant with Israel. And to be honest, friends, there are so many references to Israel as the heavens and the earth. I got overwhelmed this week reading it, and I had to stop putting stuff in the notes so you could see it. But if you really think about it, that's not unfamiliar to me and you. Because when we get to the New, uh, the new Testament and the New Covenant, we see Jesus and Paul talk about the people who believe in Jesus in the New Covenant as his creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You're familiar with this verse. You've heard it. Probably have it memorized. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a what? A new creation. See, he had an old creation under the old covenant. Jesus says, I'm going to fulfill that. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. I'm going to take a new people, a new creation, a new heavens and earth, so to say, my covenant people, and we will be his people. Friends, can I tell you today, if you're saved and in Christ Jesus, you're part of the new heavens and new earth. You're in the new covenant. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Well, what that's referencing is that covenant system. It's gone. All things have become new. Here's what I want you to note. And this is important. I'm getting ready to close. I'm about done. I know this is taxing. You wanted me to stop after we read Romans 3 because it was so good and glorious. I know you did. But just stay with me for another couple minutes. Even though the Jew and the Gentile Christians were not under the Old Covenant anymore during the times of the New Testament, the Old Covenant temple and that whole cultus was still on the scene. Uh, things were still going on there. Me and you look around right now and say, well, all of it's vanished away. Well, that's true for us now, but it wasn't all fulfilled yet whenever uh, the New Testament was being written. Once it was fulfilled, then it would vanish away. And that means that all of the Old Covenant has been fulfilled for me and you, and that heavens and earth have passed away. Again, not a physical planet or creation, God's covenant creation. And so many people today, when, when we read the Bible, and you probably thought this because I thought this, we read the Bible, and we think when Jesus died on the cross, all right, the Old Covenant was gone away with, it's New Covenant from there, it's a clean break. Well, that's not really the picture that's presented in the Bible. It's not a clean break. For 40 years, from A.D. 30 to A.D. 70, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant were both on the scene. And you can see on the left side of the screen, A.D. 30, in the green, the New Covenant's real small. Well, the New Covenant's growing over the period of the New Testament. Well, when Jesus uh, establishes the New Covenant, remember the Last Supper, this is the covenant in my blood, the New Covenant, he brings it in. The Old Covenant was fully on the scene. But the closer you got to A.D. 70, the Old Covenant began to vanish away, essentially to say the old was going to be passed and the new was going to come. Hebrews 8.13, after the cross, probably written in about the year 65 A.D., says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one, the old covenant, obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete is growing old and about or ready to vanish away. The writer of Hebrews was saying that the old covenant was fixing to be gone forever. Friends, in order for the law to be fulfilled and pass away, the covenant cursings, the covenant cursings for breaking it had to be carried out on the Jews. Now, you think about the grace of your God for a second. Somebody speak, says a bad word about one of my sons. You know what happens to me? I get mad. I get really mad. Can you imagine if somebody killed one of your kids for no reason? If somebody killed one of my sons for no reason, you know what I want? I want justice, and I want it immediately. And you would be that way too probably. They killed God's only son, Jesus Christ. You know what he did? Remember he was on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Your God is so gracious. He gave the people that killed him 40 years to repent. He said, for 40 years, you guys repent. Man, I, I'm just not wired that way. Aren't you thankful God's like God's not like me and you? 
I came home the other day. It was raining on Friday, and the neighbor's dog had got in my six bags of trash because my trash didn't run, and it was strode for a mile up and down the road, and I had to pick it up in the rain once I got home for an hour, and I was mad. I was so mad. You know what I did? I called 911, and I got in trouble by the lady on the phone. She chewed me out. She said, sir, you cannot call 911 because a dog has strode your trash out. I said, ma'am, this is an emergency. I'm about to lose my salvation on my neighbor over here if you don't get somebody out here. That's the way we think. The cop got on to me, too. I can't call 911 anymore for that. But anyway, I'm still mad at my neighbor a little bit. I'm recovering, though. That's me and you. We get mad immediately. What does God do? God's a God of grace. He gives these people that killed his son 40 years to repent. And you think about you today. If you're in here, friend, you're not saved. And you've been living for 65 years. You think about how gracious God is to you that he could kill you right now and send you to hell justly, but he's given you time to repent. There were plenty of them in the first century that didn't do it. Now what are you going to do today? That's the question. That's the question. Let's finish up here. It's almost over, I know. But there were covenant cursings. In order for that old covenant temple to vanish off the scene, there were cursings in the Old Testament. Now watch this in Isaiah 50, uh, excuse me, Not in Isaiah 51, but in Deuteronomy 28, we read some of these covenant cursings. Now get this, you're really going to like it. Here's what it said. Moses predicted about the times of the New Testament. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck and he is just until he has destroyed you. Remember what Jesus said about his yoke? His yoke was what? Easy. And his burden was light. But they wouldn't come to it. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies. Verse 52. They shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down throughout all your land. If you were a Jew and you had those, that big old temple, you were thinking, Boy, nobody's ever going to knock this down. That can't go down. But the covenant cursing said there would be a day it would. Throughout all your land, which the Lord your God will give you. Friends, God predicted a nation would come and destroy that old temple, that old covenant system to be done away with forever. You know who picked up Deuteronomy 28? Jesus did in the New Testament. Luke 21, and I'll close with this. Jesus said, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, the Roman nation would come from afar to destroy it. Then know that its desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea, don't run to the city because it's going down. Let them flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, God's vengeance on his people for rejecting him, that all things which are written may be what? Uh Uh-oh. When would it all be fulfilled? When would everything be fulfilled? When God judged Israel, removed the old covenant out of the way so that the new covenant in Jesus Christ would remain and stand. Friends, you know why you don't have to worry about any of that old covenant stuff? Because Jesus Christ fulfilled it all. He's the Savior. He's better. He's a better sacrifice. He's a better priest. He's a better temple. He's a better king. And he rules me and you. And he's the Lord of this earth. Amen? That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have people today running around saying that we should still be doing some of that stuff. I say fooey in Arkansan. If Jesus Christ didn't fulfill all the law, he's not who he said he was. But friends, the new covenant is here in full. I hope today that you've heard the gospel, friends. You've heard your need of, of Jesus and a Savior. It's the first day of a new year. Let this be the year that you repent of your sins and come trust Christ. Stand with me today. and You come and make that profession of faith known. That you love Christ Jesus. That you believe he fulfilled it on your behalf and by faith. You're counted righteous because of him.